you for this interaction. Thank you for uh, sharing the information. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. It's also the occasion to uh, uh, discuss what the EU is doing in the area of food, what we have been doing for here, and what is the, the important role that the European, the European Union is playing in this field. Uh, as you can see, the title of my presentation, I define the EU as a global superpower of food. Uh, I think you spent this early afternoon talking about the global superpower of uh, economics and maybe also military superpower. We are not a uh, military superpower, but it was certainly a superpower in the area of food, because we are the first food exporter and the, food, the first food importer in the world. That means that what the EU does or does not in this area has an impact on the rest of the world. And I will try to um, uh, sketch a history of the way the approach to food in the EU and in Europe has changed, especially after World War uh, II. Um, I'm touching particularly to three subjects, which is the aspect of food security, then the element of food safety, which has become particularly important after the 90s, and the new aspect and what we are discussing now in Brussels, but I guess everywhere in Europe, which is the connection between food, food production, and sustainability. Uh, before getting there, uh, I think it's important to stress the importance of food. When we, when we think about food, usually we think about a commodity or something that you can trade, or uh, more basically the essence of our daily life. It's probably much more than this, and I think that we are in a, in a country and in a region that can proudly say so. Because food is more than, than this. Food is part of the tradition, is part of the wealth of certain territory, is part of what uh, our, uh, our regions and, uh, and communities produce. And if you think of the importance of food in Europe, uh, I think this is particularly true. Whether you take our uh, Italian production or the French production or the Spanish, the Spanish production, I usually say Parmigiano, Spanish ham, French champagne, we are uh, producing probably some of the best and the highest value food in the world. And this gives us a special role in this, in this trade, but also a special role and special responsibility in defining the policies that, um, that surround, uh, surround, uh, surround food. Let's start with the idea of, um, of food security. Uh, the definition of food security uh, derives from 1996 World Food Summit, which defines food security as a situation when all people at all times have physical and economic access to sufficient, safe and nutrition food that meets their dietary needs and food preferences for an active and healthy life. So you see, it's quite, it's quite complex. It's quite complex and it's not obvious. Uh, to get there, uh, also at European level, it took us a while. Uh, if we had been in the street of Paris, Rome or Berlin in 1945, we would have easily realized that food security was an issue. And by, by the way, there's been an issue for a few years after the end of um, World War II. Um, that's why the uh, initial approach of uh, Europe, what's called, what, was, what was at the time uh, the European Economic Community and then the Common Market, uh, was uh, asked on the idea of uh, food security, to ensure enough safe food for uh, European people. Um, and this has been done in a different way. Uh, initially, and I think we shouldn't forget this, uh, it has been particularly important the support of the Marshall Plan from the US that was able to rebuild part of our agriculture, part of our uh, structure in the agricultural world. But the real, um, the real success of uh, our European approach to food has been the common agricultural policy. And I know that defending the common agricultural policy nowadays is not an easy job. Uh, you've certainly had a lot of uh, criticism of the impact of the common agricultural policy on the environment, on, the, on third countries, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are certainly elements of truth, you know this, but it is also true that the common agricultural policy was able to uh, ensure for uh, a number of decades the food security of, of the EU. And if you look at the way the treaty in 1957, the treaty uh, establishing um, the European community, has defined the, uh, 
the objectives of a common agricultural policy, you will see that the focus is really on productivity, on ensuring uh, fair standards of living for our farmers, to stabilize the market and to ensure the availability of supplies while uh, making sure that consumers will get a fair price for what, what they buy. The common agricultural policy became operational only in 62, uh, and then it, it went through a number of uh, reforms that basically were done to uh, modernize the agricultural world and at a certain point to take also into account some of the impacts that the agricultural policy was, was having. You are too young, but I still remember uh, oranges being destroyed in Sicily in order to uh, maintain a certain level of price because there was clearly a situation of overproduction. Now, all this is over. I think we have completely changed the approach uh, in which the common agricultural policy has been shaped, moving from uh, support based on production to support based on the on the to the farmers themselves so to the living standards of the farmers and there is as we clear uh, a lot to be done yet and this is part of the discussion that we have been having in the first steps of from the Ryan commission and it's probably part of the subject and discussion that we will have also in the next term as has been made clear in this day due in these days during the hearing of the new commissioner for, for agriculture. Having said that, we shouldn't forget, uh, however, some of the success of the common agricultural policy. Uh, as I said, uh, in 1945, Europe was literally starting. And we have uh, this policy, uh, obviously together with the uh, improvement of the economic condition, uh, has succeeded in transforming what I call starting Europe into a spot in Europe. As I said, we are the first global exporter of food, and I think it's something we should be happy about. Um, it has um, allowed uh, good living conditions for our farmers in a context, especially in the 60s and the 70s, where a number of farmers were leaving their lands, were moving to the cities, so the common agricultural policy has also ensured part of this uh, uh, important social, social, social transition, transition. It has stabilized the European market. I think uh, we can say easily that the access to food is no longer an issue on our market. We can discuss about inflation, we can discuss about quality, we can discuss and we will discuss in a few minutes about safety, but certainly food is there and is there and is there for hopefully everybody, even though there are still statistics saying that there are still a number of Europeans and not, a, not able to get uh, a meaningful meal uh, every day. But this is more uh, a social problem rather than a problem of availability. What is also very significant is that through this policy and through obviously also the improvement of the economic conditions, the club was able to um, uh, provide food at reasonable price to consumers. I'm referring here to the impact of uh, food in the, in the household expenditure, in the average household expenditure of an average European. We moved uh, from more than 50% to 20%. And this is quite important. It means that if you spend 20% instead of 50% on getting your food, you have much more to spend on other issues, education, culture, uh, entertainment, so this is also important and there's a clear uh, social, uh, social, social value. But what is probably more important is that the common agricultural policy has been the basis for uh, the creation of what I call the great, great uh, food powerhouse of the EU. Look at these numbers, they're quite impressive. These are the numbers of the EU food and drink industry. And you will see uh, that no, some of them explain very clearly why uh, the, food, uh, the food sector is so important for, for the EU. It is the first EU employer, the first EU manufacturing sector. It, has, uh, it is clearly leading worldwide, while creating an important trade surplus for the EU of more than uh, 67 billion euros, and it's one of the few sectors, I believe, where we still have a, a substantially important trade, trade surplus. And more uh, importantly, I would say, it has a strategic uh, resilience in time of economic crisis. 
If you go back to the COVID time, I think you are young, not too young, not to, not, not to remember the COVID crisis, probably the only area, the only sector that was surviving without major impact on employment, on income, was the food sector. That shows its, uh, its resilience and its ability also to jump in times of crisis. And by the way, the same happened, happened during the, the last two big financial crises. So while, while other sectors were suffering, the European food sector was able to maintain its position, to maintain its, uh, its level of uh, employment. And I think this is a debate that is particularly important at the moment, where we have a major crisis in the automotive sector of, of the EU, uh, to understand what are the areas where uh, uh, we are still able to have good economic, uh, good economic output. Uh, putting this as a joke, I like to say that you know, wine and sausages and cheese are to the EU what iPhone and Facebook are to the US. Now, we can discuss about it, <laughs> iPhones and, and, and Facebook, I don't know, but it's certainly true that this uh, sector uh, plays an important role uh, for our economy. And that's why it is so important that, the, that we take care, you know, in the policies that we define at European national level, we take care of the sector, we consider what is the impact that our policies are having on, on the sector itself. But what are the reasons for the uh, success of this sector? I mentioned the common agricultural policy, which, which has been probably the basis in terms of providing the necessary basic element for our food industry. But there are a number of additional issues. The ability of being competitive in, on the rest of the world. Technological progress, which has been one of the, uh, let's say, important uh, elements of our food industry, food industry worldwide. Um, tradition. Uh, reputation in terms of, of, uh, of quality is something that has accompanied the European food uh, industry uh, in a number of areas. I mentioned wine, I could mention confectionery, uh, you know, there are a number of sectors where the quality, the name of the European uh, industry uh, implies a very good reputation. The fact of having a big internal market, we should never forget this. We have uh, one of the biggest internal markets in the world. And for the industry, essential the ability to have 500 million consumers uh, as uh, uh, an internal market is, is essential for that industry to, to grow and to uh, define strategies that could lead and make this industry leader worldwide. Uh, but then, obviously, there's also the issue of, of safety. Uh, this is a very important element because it has become uh, one of the uh, most, in, most relevant um, elements for our industry worldwide. So, uh, very often our food is a, a synonym of safety. And I will come to this in a moment. Uh, and I refer to sustainability, because this is in a way it's the challenge of the future. If we want <coughs> to remain competitive in a world which is demanding more and more, it is also important that our food is perceived not only as being safe, but also as being sustainable. And I think most of us, and just like us, many other people in the world, try to make choice on their food that are based on sustainability. So having a reputation on sustainability is extremely, extremely important. Now this obliges me to go a bit um, back to uh, the 90s, and when the moment where the whole idea of food safety has been, has been built. Uh, I don't want to keep you very long with the history of safety in the EU, uh, but again, since you are very young, I think it's important that we um, refer to some uh, facts that have shaped the food safety policy of the European Union. In particular, during the 90s, there have been a number of uh, food safety scandals that had an impact on, on the EU and on the reputation of our food uh, in the internal market and outside the internal market. The first and probably the most important was the so-called bovine spongiform encephalopathy that is probably well better known as the mad cow disease. Um, at a certain point, uh, uh, we realized that because of this, of this disease, uh, there was a huge impact on, uh, on, uh, uh, on the EU, the European at the time, beef market. Uh, 
We still don't know the full impact of this crisis. We know certainly that there were at least 175 people dead in the UK, a number of other people affected by this, this disease uh, in, uh, uh, in the different, in different member states of, of the Union. And this has led to uh, uh, a quite important series of consequences, especially in economic terms. There has been a ban on the HP, a ban that was also translated in other countries into a ban to uh, European meat products, beef products, not generally meat products. Uh, and this costed only to the UK more than one billion pounds, not to mention the impact on the common agricultural policy, the impact on our exports, uh, and the impact on the overall uh, uh, EU market uh, in terms of, of meat. Uh, this was the first step of the internal reflection. Obviously, a disease, a disease is difficult to stop. But, but what we realized in analyzing this disease is that behind this disease, there were a number of uh, loopholes in the European food safety system. And these were uh, very clearly identified by the uh, Medina Ortega report published by the European, the European Parliament. In particular, it was um, this report made clear that among the different criticism and uh, weak points of our uh, system, one of the most important was the absence of a strong legal framework on, on food safety. Lack of transparency in the decision. At the time, the decisions were taken by technical committees uh, composed by members uh, of the different member states and the European Commission without a uh, uh, real uh, scientific background and scientific knowledge. And when it comes to defining to uh, define your response to a specific disease, it's the same essential to make reference and to have good scientific, uh, good scientific advice. And more importantly, it was the report made clear that there were very uh, poor level of controls uh, worldwide, uh, Europe, in the European one. So what we were lacking was uh, a serious uh, European way of controlling the food market. So on one side we had a, a, a common integrated market already at the time, but there was no real food safety legislation in place, no real food control legislation in place. This question um, became even more serious a few years afterwards, in 1999, where new uh, food scandals became relevant in the EU. Basically, it was a case of dioxin uh, that was used in the production of feed and that entered the, uh, the uh, European food market with an impact again on poultry, meat, uh, pig, cattle, so in general on the European uh, market of, of meat. And again, important uh, repercussion in terms of uh, economic impact and more importantly, uh, uh, reputational damage for uh, an important area of our, of our food. I think this, uh, all this crisis in the 1990s were a bit of a wake-up call for the EU, in the sense that we realized that at the European level, sorry, European level we didn't have, uh, as I said, uh, a real system of food safety. So yes, there was an internal market, yes, the meat product and in general food product could move easily from one place to another in, uh, within the internal market, but the level of control and the level of safety that was uh, ensured at the time, was not uh, appropriate to such a big internal, internal market. So a, few num a number of uh, uh, lessons were uh, defined, were the whole of on, the, on the basis of this crisis. First of all, the lack of uh, good scientific uh, control, uh, the good scientific advice, so this was something extremely important. At the time, all the scientific companies were uh, basically responding to the Commission. So they were not independent, they were responding to, the, to, the, to what is considered to be the risk management. There was not a real strong, strong scientific advice behind. There was a lack of scientific data. If you want to have a good scientific advice, you need to base your advice on data. And there was no European repository of uh, food uh, scientific, scientific data. Uh, as I said, there was uh, a lack of transparency in the decision. At the time, decisions were uh, taken by a group of experts in Brussels uh, without, uh, again, a real discussion with those, with the real experts on the ground, with the real scientific advisors. Uh, and more importantly, there was 
an approach that was still uh, based on either food or feed. So there was no integration between the food chain and the feed chain. And you talk to any, uh, uh, any scientist, uh, expert in nutrition or in veterinary matters, and they would easily tell you that if you have a problem in the feed area, this problem will soon emerge in the food area. So you cannot treat the two chains as two separate chains, because they're actually one chain, and what you put in your feed will end up, in a way, in, 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 in the food. More importantly, probably there was a complete lack of traceability. Yes, products were moving from one place to another within the internal market, but it was very difficult to trace them back. So in case of a specific crisis, it was almost impossible to intervene because the products were spreading around without a clear understanding of where they came from or where they were going. And there was a complete lack of emergency, emergency procedures in case, uh, in case of crisis. So as you see, uh, both the Ortega report of the European Parliament and the analysis made by a number of specialists indicated that there was a need to intervene in the, in the area and to uh, completely rewrite the rules uh, behind food safety in the EU. This was the uh, um, objective, the aim of the white paper that was published by uh, the Commission in 2000. Now the definition white paper is no longer <laughs> there. The white paper at the time was basically a program of legislation. So basically a promise, a commitment by the Commission to propose a number of legislative acts and to um, and the way to define uh, to define the objectives, the major objectives of these legislative acts. In a way the white paper has uh, was uh, the beginning of a real revolution in the area of, of food safety. It was based on the idea that if you want to have a real internal market of food, then you need to have one common set of rules and one common set of rules concerning, concerning control. So this implies obviously moving from a system where there were few directives and a lot of a number of uh, national legislation into a full harmonization of the system. So basically what the white paper indicates as the way forward is a complete harmonization of the European food safety uh, system. The number of actions to be taken, in particular 84 measures are listed into this, uh, this white paper, and uh, the most important of which is uh, the general food law. That's called also the, the Bible of food law in a way. Because it is the, the legislation, the regulation, defining all the principles of food safety and creating the basic uh, rules that applies to food, uh, to food safety. Now, as I say, I don't want to enter too much in all the details, but I think we need at least to analyze these four, these ten specific points that are the basis of what, or the way that food safety is intended in, in the EU. And then we go one by one quickly through them. The first one is the level of obligation for the food business operators. It's something that before was not defined at, uh, at European level and which now is very clear in the, food, uh, in, in the general food law. So there is obviously an obligation to put on the market only safe food and this is the primary responsibility for the food business operator. Uh, so they have the responsibility to verify the safety at all the stages of the production and to intervene at each moment where they, they, they realize or they suspect there might be an issue of food safety and this could imply going uh, uh, up to recalling or withdrawing the product from the market. So all these are uh, notions that were already there in the food safety discussion but that were, were not defined at European level. So now we have a system that applies everywhere from uh, Lisbon to Vilnius, you have exactly the same rules applying to all the food put on, on the market. Um, the second important aspect is the obligations for import and export. So, and this is two articles, 11 and 12 of the, the general food law, that by the way have created a lot of discussion at the time. Because what we uh, say is that uh, the import, so the food that is imported in the EU, uh, should comply with the EU standards. Uh, what, which is not exactly the same that the food that is exported from the EU. So the food that is exported from the EU to other countries should comply with European standards, 
but can also uh, comply with the relevant agreements that are defined in by other agreements with this, with this, this campus. And this has a bit in the discussion about this notion of fortress Europe, because it gives the impression that the level of safety that we are imposing on those exporting their food to the EU is higher uh, than the level of safety that we are imposing for ourselves when we export food to the other I think this is true just to a certain extent, uh, but there is an element of truth that it is true that uh, we are certainly more cautious when it, come to, when it comes to the imports that enter our territory than when it comes to what we are exporting worldwide. I think this is also part of the idea that we are controlling what gets into the EU, others should control what you know, is exported by the EU to their, to their territory. There is also uh, and important obligations on, on control. And this is probably one of the key areas that was missing at the time. So I'm not saying that before the 90s there was no control of safety, but these controls were really scattered. So every member state would have its so level of control, very little communication at European level. Now, after the, uh, the general uh, food law and uh, the food control regulation, there is uh, a specific system in place which is based on one uh, directory based in the range in, in, in Ireland dealing with controls and doing inspections. So what this directory is doing is controlling the member states and making sure that each member state is uh, doing appropriate controls on the basis of priorities which are defined at European level. We do even more. We go and control the account. So systematically, there's a certain number of audits and inspection covers not just the, the member states of the EU, but also all the, all the third countries that are exported to the EU. Uh, and by the way, this is a precondition. So in order to, especially in the meat sector, if you want to export meat uh, and in general like products from uh, third countries to the EU, the first thing you need to have is uh, an audit and inspection by the veterinary office of the European Union that certifies that the level of control that this third country is putting in place is equivalent to the level of control that we, we put in place in the EU territory. Uh, and this, I believe, it's extremely important because it gives us uh, the uh, guarantee that what is entering the EU territory is in line with our, with our standard. Just to give you an idea, we have more than 200 uh, inspections per uh, year, and at least 10 to 15 percent of these inspections are on third countries. And uh, the inspection can be very, uh, I've been to a couple of these inspections, they can be very thorough, very serious, and in 24 hours, Brussels receive a report, an, info, an information report on these inspections, and so we can quickly decide, for instance, to block certain exports from a certain country if the standards are not in line with the, <coughs> with the EU standard. Now, I'm not saying that we systematically block export. No, we don't. Uh, usually, these inspections have a positive outcome, but there has been a few cases where uh, the inspections were so bad that in a few uh, days, uh, a certain country was, was no longer allowed to export food products to EU. We have a case with Vietnam on, uh, on, uh, on uh, agricultural products. Uh, we had cases that were not linked, we had cases where at a certain point we realized that unauthorized genetically modified products from China were entering the market. So in that case, it worked the other way around. So we stopped immediately the import and then we sent the inspection to China to understand what was going on. Uh, and after that inspection, we were able to uh, reopen the market, but under the condition that each consignment of rice should be accompanied by a specific certification. By the way, we did the same in the US. There was a case of a genetically modified rice, which is legal in the EU, entering the EU market. It was a contamination case. So we did exactly the same. In, uh, 72 hours, we impose a certificate, 
and then we sent a few months later an inspection to make sure that everything was, was in line. Obviously, when you impose a certification, you impose a certain number of control. It doesn't mean that every consignment of rice is controlled, but you define <coughs> a certain amount that has to be controlled, can be 10%, uh, 5%, and it give you, gives you a sample uh, quite important to understand if there is still a problem with a specific, with a specific problem. The integrated approach, this I mentioned before, I think it's, uh, it's important to understand that it was a bit of a complete Copernican change in a way. We moved from a place where uh, food and feed were dead in a completely different way uh, into uh, an approach which is completely integrated, from stable to table. So really the entire system is controlled. And it's controlled because some of the scandals that we had both the med cow disease and the dioxin crisis were actually feed scandals because they were based on the way the feed production was done. In particular, in the case of the med cow disease, we realized that we were giving cow, or what was left from cow production, to be eaten by cows, which is a bit, <laughs> a bit uh, 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 incredible nowadays, but it was the case at the time. And in the case of dioxin, we realized that there were uh, oil that should not be in the feed chain, that enter the feed chain, uh, so the cereal oils, and these were used to produce feed. And hey, if you have a problem in the feed, the same problem will stay in your meat and it will come to the, to the food chain. So the fact of introducing a complete, um, a complete integrated approach uh, between food and feed is, uh, is, is a very important one. And by the way, it has become a model, something that was not there at the time. And after this approach has been taken by you, uh, other countries have taken basically the same, the same decision, uh, including China and the US, whose food system is not very far from ours, especially China, when they decided to, to have, to introduce a, a stringent regulation on food safety following the big meat scandal in China. Basically what they did, they took the general uh, food law and, and they copied it. You know? <laughs> You know, Chinese are very good at improving what you want to do. So they, they took our general food law, they copied, and now they have a very stringent system in place, which is probably equivalent to what, to what we have in the Another essential element of the new approach is the integration and, uh, between risk assessment and risk management. Uh, this is very important to understand, and it was one of the weak points in the previous system. If you want to have food safety, but this is, you can apply to everything which is uh, science-based. If you want to have policy decisions in the area of food safety, in the area of pharmaceuticals, in, the, in all the areas where you need to have a strong scientific advice, a solid scientific advice, you need to make sure that there is a functional, methodological, and organizational separation between the risk assessment and the risk, and the risk, uh, and the risk management. Why? Uh, Basically, because the risk management will always tend, to a certain extent, to influence the risk assessment if there is not no separation, which was exactly what happened to the med cow disease and the med cow scandal. At a, certain, at a certain point, it was clear that there was a problem there, but since there was no uh, European scientific body able to tell the managers, listen, this is the problem, this is what you should do. Uh, the decision there was a, a mix of decisions that were partially uh, risk assessment and, past, and partially risk management, with obviously a certain level of politicization of uh, the decision taken by the risk manager. Because the risk manager are very often people from public administration, they take into account economic interests, they take into account uh, the political landscape which is not the case for scientists. So it is very important that you separate the scientific assessment from the scientific management. Because the scientific assessment should tell you what are the basis of your decision. And then the scientific managers are responsible for taking the decision on the basis of additional consideration. It can include certainly you know, economic impact and so on and so forth. This was not the case before the medical disease. It became the case after the uh, after the adoption of the general food law, and this has led to the creation of the European Food Safety Authority, which is now the basis of our assessment, scientific assessment in the area of food. 
And I want to stress, this is quite a unique model. Uh, if you take the, the, the US system, with my colleague would confirm, there's not such a strong separation. What the FDA is doing through the drug administration is a bit of a mix with scientific assessment and management. And this, my opinion, and it's not good. You know, if you want to have serious scientific assessment, you need to have it completely separate from the political or the policy decisions of risk manager. And this is what I think we have done in the uh, in, in the year. Uh, I will probably yeah be quick on this because I think it's part part of the thing. Uh, how do we do risk management? So as I say, the risk assessment is done by scientists, is done by the European Food Safety Authority, which by the way is based not very far from here in Parma, and I will come to this in a second. The risk assessment, the risk management is done at European level by the Commission in uh, cooperation with the member states. And I always want to stress this point because <coughs> you very often read on newspaper the Commission has decided to adopt uh, pesticide, the Commission has decided to authorize a genetically modified organism, the Commission has decided this, the Commission has decided that. Yes, the Commission is behind the proposal, but all these decisions uh, are taken into a specific committee which is composed by the 27 member states of the European Union. So all these decisions, when taken, are always supported by all the member states, or by at least the majority of these member states, and they are taken in this nice committee which is called uh, Plant, Animal, Food and Feed, uh, which has 14 different sections, so depending on the area which you have to decide. So they cover everything from pesticide to uh, genetically modified organisms to animal health, animal welfare. So it's, uh, um, it's really there where the decision making is, is based. Each decision has to be based on the scientific opinion of the European Food Safety Authority. This is also very, it's very important to understand that, is that each decision concerning food safety has to, be, uh, has to follow, in a way, the scientific opinion of the European Food Safety Authority. As risk manager, yes, we have the possibility of taking different decisions as those suggested by EFSA, but when we do so, we need to provide a justification. And I think in 98% of the cases, what we do, I wouldn't say we have a stamp, but we certainly follow the EFSA opinion, also because it would be very difficult for the European Commission and for the Member States to justify that they are taking the decision different from what is suggested by, by, by scientists. It is clear that when we do risk management, we take into account other legitimate factors. So this is where we can take into account the impact on the economy, the social impact, the, the general feeling of, uh, of the population, and so on and so forth. And when it comes to very sensitive areas like genetically modified organs, it's clear that this can be a factor. So on one side, you might have a very or a certainly positive uh, risk assessment by the European Food Safety Authority, but on the other side, you might also want to uh, take the decision which is in line with what is you know, felt or requested by an important number of European citizens. And this is where still you might have a certain degree of uh, of control, to a certain degree of incoherence, if you want to call it like this, between the scientific assessment and the, the risk, the risk uh, Yeah. Another important aspect introduced by the uh, general law is the precautionary principle. I add there the definition. I think what is important to understand on the precautionary principle is that there has been, I would say, probably entire libraries written on precautionary principle and the way it, it, it works. Uh, and sometimes we, uh, also as Commission, we are confronted with this uh, idea coming, especially for certain NGOs, that whenever there is a level of uncertainty, we should apply the precautionary principle and basically we should not decide and we should avoid taking any decision which is controversial. In reality, when you look at the way the precautionary principle is, has been defined, in the, in, the, in the general law, you, uh, you will see that there are a number of conditions that must be there before we can really make reference to the precautionary, to the precautionary principle. In particular, uh, the, the text says that there must be an assessment of the available information, 
that leads to the possibility of harmful effects on health, and this has to be identified even though there is a certain level of scientific uncertainty. So in that specific case, you can take risk management measures that have to be provisional, so they cannot stay there forever, pending further scientific information. So, you see, you could really write three PhD theses on each and any of these words put in, in, in red. Uh, there have been a number of, uh, of analyses, also a number of cases, also in the, in the WTO context, where the EU, by the way, has lost some of the cases on the precautionary principle, especially on the hormone beef, so our ban on beef treated with hormones uh, imported from, from the US. Uh, and it actually based on this, so when you might have scientific uncertainty, but the fact of having scientific, scientific uncertainty should not prevent you from taking, taking a decision. You should take a decision on the basis of the information that you have, you can take a decision that is restricted on condition that this is provisional, so that he has a specific you know, end date, and that in the meanwhile you are doing whatever you can to acquire the scientific knowledge that you don't have. So this is where uh, sometimes the controversy on the adoption and the use of the precautionary principles uh, arise, because there are cases where uh, we are saying, yes, but these elements you don't know. There are elements that you know, so you shouldn't decide. You shouldn't authorize a pesticide because there are certain elements which remain unknown. Or you shouldn't authorize uh, a GMO because we don't know what we'll discover in 20 years about genetically modified organisms, and so on and so forth. The reality is that the decision has to be, take, has to be taken on the basis of the level of knowledge that you have at that moment, why considering the uncertainty, obviously, but with all the conditions that are spread out in this, in this, uh, in this, precautionary, uh, in this precautionary principle. And sometimes, as I say, there has been a number of misunderstandings on this. The Commission has also published in 2000 a specific communication, which has then been uh, revised on a number of, of, a number of times, on defining uh, what we intend for precautionary principle. But I'm pretty sure that this debate will remain there. Uh, we have the same debate in environmental issue as um, as, uh, as, as, well, as it was told by, uh, said by Professor Finizio. Uh, I'm now working on uh, on fishery policies where we define the fishery quota for in the different world oceans, and each time we have certain level of uncertainty on the right level of catches that you can take in a certain area. Uh, we, we are always requested to use the precautionary principle and to stop basically fishing, which is obviously not necessarily an option. So you need to decide on the basis of the information that, that you have, and you need to do the best as you, that you can in order to get the information that is, is missing. Now, moving ahead, uh, the other uh, very important element that's been introduced by the general food law is the traceability. And this is something that on which I would like to spend a few minutes because it's not sometimes it's quite unknown, but it's actually very important. This is the basis of our food system. What is the traceability? The traceability is what uh, uh, makes possible to identify the different step that any single product uh, goes through in the food in the food chain. Basically, each food and feed business operator has to know to whom and from whom a product has been supplied. So if you are a business operator working in the food area, you produce biscuit, you need to know exactly where your basic products and primary products come from, and to whom you have sold your, uh, your biscuits. Why is this so important? It is so important because this allows the public authorities, the commission, but also the national public authorities, to intervene each, each time there is a specific, uh, a specific case or a specific uh, problem in the, food, uh, in the food chain. So in the case, for instance, of the uh, dioxin crisis in the 90s, it took more than one year to identify the different suppliers, and probably we were, we were never able to identify all of them. In the most recent issues that we had in the food chain, we were able to identify the source of the problem in less than 48 hours. And I will mention specifically, in uh, 2011, if I remember well, 
the was what is called the Earth Needs Scandal, which by the way was not a food safety issue, but was more, more a case of fraud. So basically it was Earth meat sold as beef meat that entered different products in the European food chain, from lasagne produced in Luxembourg to the IKEA meat uh, meatballs. So there were basically this horse meat was everywhere. Horse meat, yes. Now, maybe as an Italian, you are not particularly shocked by the fact of eating horse meat. But uh, in other cultures, this is extremely serious. For a British, for an Irish, it's completely inconceivable that you can eat horse meat. In any case, it was a fraud. So we had an obligation to intervene on the market and understand where this fraud was coming from. And in 48 hours, we were able to identify all the different steps of taken by this product. It was actually uh, horse meat uh, produced in Romania, sold correctly and legally as horse meat to a French company, and this French company relabeled the meat into beef meat, obviously because beef meat, beef meat is more expensive and more valuable than horse meat, and this French company sold this relabeled meat to you know, a number of different suppliers, a number of different uh, producers uh, across Europe, and as I said, in 48 hours, thanks to the traceability system, we were able to trace all the different steps taken by this meat to intervene and to sanction those uh, uh, companies that were responsible for uh, the fraud issue. I think this is uh, an important example of what has changed uh, between, you know, in, the last, in the last years in the European market. So you see it's quite simple basically. Each uh, producer, each food business operator has to know exactly where its product comes from and to whom it has sold this product. It's very basic. You need to keep this information for at least five years and it gives the possibility to public authorities to intervene if needed in a very quick way. Also in the case of uh, withdrawal or recall, if you need to withdraw a product because it's unsafe or because there is a fraud behind, through the system you can do it very quickly because you know exactly where that specific product has gone. And this is particularly important because contrary to what sometimes we think, I know we like to, we love to think that our food it's local, that you know, we know the local farmers, so this is very good. But the reality is that the majority of the food we buy uh, is, uh, it comes from you know, different sources, from different producers around Europe, and sometimes even beyond Europe. So it is very, very important that we are able to, if we want to have a single market of food, we need to have this flexibility system in place and operation in order to uh, ensure the safety of what we are buying and of what we are eating. Uh, I think I need to up a bit. Uh, on this, <laughs> I will uh, in, uh, add that in addition to this, there is a crisis management procedure that allows the European Commission, in cooperation with the Member States, to take a decision very quickly, also in, in few hours if needed, in order to block or to stop a certain product on the, on the, on, on, on the market. And we have, uh, in this context, what's called the Rapid Alert System, which is a system that is, uh, um, provides information to all the 27 member states, plus uh, UK, Norway, Norway and others, and it allows to uh, immediately send information whenever there is uh, a problem on, uh, on food. So, assuming, imagine that you find and a food which is not compliant arriving to the port of Rotterdam and coming from, I don't know, the US. Uh, the authority of the Netherlands, as soon as they find that product, they will put a notification in the system. The notification is available immediately, in real time, to all the national public authorities and the European Commission. And this allows everybody, first of all, to know that there is a problem concerning that specific product, Second, to check internally if that product has come, has already arrived, or has entered the food chain through other means. So it gives us a certain level of guarantee that these products are immediately uh, identified. And as you can see, there are quite few, if we take 2020, there are quite a few uh, notifications and even more alerts, so more than 1,000 alerts, so 1,000 potential cases of food safety issue issues linked to products introduced or imported into, into, into the EU. And I'm not saying this to say that the products we import are less good than what we produce ourselves. I'm just saying this 
to explain that we are really trying to check as much as possible what enters the, uh, the EU market in terms, uh, in terms of food. There is uh, one of the issues that was uh, also highlighted during the, uh, the crisis of the 90s was the fact that the decision-making process was non-transparent. Uh, I don't like the expression behind closed doors in Brussels, but to a certain extent it was true that some of the decisions concerning food safety issues were taken by committees that were not very well known and there was very little public consultation. Now, one of the issues that has been done is that most of the decisions taken go through a specific period of public consultation that gives the possibility to everybody, stakeholders, citizens, to come uh, and provide information on specific issues. And by the way, this has been uh, additionally reinforced in the um, reform of the general food law that has been adopted in uh, 2017, where we uh, additionally added for the renewal and the adoption of new product a specific uh, period during which uh, citizens or NGOs could come and, uh, and uh, provide additional information, not only to the European Commission, but also to the European Food Safety Authority. Why this is important? This is important because obviously the European Food Safety Authority is composed by some of the best scientists in Europe, but it doesn't mean that they have necessarily all the information on all the scientific papers that are published in the world. So this is where uh, citizens, and particularly NGOs, have the occasion to raise certain concerns and certain issues concerning, concerning the authorization of certain products. And I think I'm not uh, revealing anything new if I say that the most sensitive products are certainly pesticides and genetically modified organisms. This is where most of the debate uh, takes place. Uh, as I say, the general law also creates the European Food Safety Authority, um, which has now a staff of more than 500 people based in Parma, and what they do basically, they uh, provide scientific opinion to the European Commission, to the Member States, to the European Parliament, and they work uh, through a system of committees that uh, takes place in Parma. <clears throat> so basically, Parma has the secretariat of these committees, and these committees are composed by scientists that come from all over Europe. So they are not necessarily uh, staff of the EFSA. They are paid to come three, four, five, ten days per month to Parma and to decide on specific issues, particularly linked to decision uh, in the area of, of in the area of food, uh, of food safety. And as you will see, these committees or these scientific panels cover the entire uh, possible area of the food industry, so from animal health and welfare uh, up to plant protection products. Plus, there is a specific scientific committee in place which ensures the coherence of the different panels and make sure that even though the panels are uh, very sectorial in the way they work, that the overall approach that EFSA is taking to food safety is coherent and remains, uh, remains, the, remains the same. <coughs> okay, I wanted to, be, to get there, to uh, be clear in what is the result of the general health law and the implementation of the white paper of 2000. So, as you see, basically what has been created since 2000 is uh, a complete uh, system, framework, a legal framework covering all the different sectors, from farmers to food industry to consumers to food control. So, each and any single step of the European food chain uh, has behind a specific European legislation and a specific uh, system of rules that applies, as I said, uh, in the same way in all the territory of the European Union, and to a certain extent also beyond, because even if the UK has uh, uh, withdrawn from the EU, they still are applying the same uh, food safety rules that we apply, not just the UK, but it's also the case for Norway, for Switzerland, and for other countries that have decided to apply the same rules. So the outcome of all this is that uh, there has been no major uh, food crisis since the adoption of this model. Uh, 
I think we can easily say that uh, the protection of EU citizens is guaranteed by this, this system. And as I say, the EU has created a model of food safety which is applied worldwide. So the same approach is applied by a number of countries. And by the way, uh, even in some of the uh, relations between third countries, sometimes, if you are certified to export to the EU, there are a number of third countries that would accept your product just because you are certified to export to the EU. Meaning that there are especially you know, small countries that might not have necessarily the same means as we have to ensure we have a big food safety agency. They recognize and they accept the uh, scientific advice of the European Food Safety Authority and the certification which is done by our veterinary office. So if you're good for the EU, usually you're good to export to everywhere else. Now, having said that, I think we have to move to the next step, and the next step is food sustainability. So what we did in the 90s and at the beginning of 2000 was to ensure uh, what we consider as the most or the safest uh, level of food in the world. But, but the debate on food, in a way, has moved somewhere else. And it has moved somewhere else because food is not only a very important economic sector, it's also an area which is having a huge uh, impact in terms of environment. I said I don't want to open here the debate about meat, the impact on meat on climate change, CO2 emissions, but this is there, it's part of the debate we are having. Uh, you take meat, you take pesticides, you take land use, it is clear that the way we produce food, not just in the EU, but worldwide, as an impact on the environment, as an impact on the issue of climate change, as an impact on the, on the future of the planet. So discussing this issue, in the moment where these issues become so central in the political debate, it is also clear that the, the way we look at food is not just from the previous perspective of food security and food safety, but we need to take into account food sustainability and the way we produce food and the impact this is having on the world. Um, I have here a few slides that you know, are quite telling in a way. The first one is about the challenge, in, the challenge of feeding the world. Uh, we know that by 2050 we will be around 10 billion people on the planet, a bit less. Uh, with certain counters that we have there where the, the population is absolutely exploding. So on one side we have an obligation as human beings and particularly as you I would say to make sure that our food production for the spot, that we are able to feed these people, because obviously uh, it is essential and it's also essential to guarantee geopolitical stability. At the same time, and this is quite a problem particularly in, uh, in, uh, in developed countries, we have an important level of food waste. Um, this is, these are numbers of a few years ago, but they remain uh, more or less valid. There are more than 88 million tons of food that are wasted every year in, in the EU. So approximately 20%, 20% of the food we produce is wasted, goes to the bin, either because it's not uh, distributed in time or because it's wasted at consumer level or because it has little problems and it doesn't, it, it doesn't make it to the market. So for a number of different reasons, 20% of our food, of the food which is produced in the EU, is, uh, is wasted. And if you take uh, food waste worldwide, it would basically be the third source of emission after uh, China and the US. So if food waste was a country, it would be the third most polluting country in terms of CO2 emission. So if you are able to stop food waste or to reduce food waste, we are able also to reduce the number of emissions that, that we are producing. That's why food waste is also one of the sustainable development goals uh, defined at UN level. So with the idea that by 2030 we should reduce by 50% the food waste at retail and consumer level. Are we going in the right direction? The simple answer is no. We are doing many things, but we are not going in the right direction. Also the EU is involved in this, uh, in this uh, challenge. Since 2015, we have a specific EU program on food waste, which covers a number of issues, 
including the creation of a specific platform on food waste and food losses, and a number also of uh, guide nets and decisions that should help reducing the level of food waste. And I put this there because it's probably the first time in reality that he, that apart obviously the discussion of the cup and the greening of the cup, is really the first time that the issue of sustainability has become or has been linked strongly with the discussion on, uh, on, uh, on, on food, with the adoption also of a specific waste of situation. Uh, on 2018, again, to reduce the level of waste in the area, in the area of food. Uh, now, this is where we were until 2018. And then something quite important happened. The new commission arrived in 2020, the Lyon Commission, and this is where, for the first time, the issue of uh, food sustainability has been put at the very center of the political priorities of the EU and of the European Commission, with the um, adoption of what has been called the European Green Deal. In the European Green Deal, a very important part, a very important element of the European Green Deal is what is called the Farm to Fork Strategy. The idea of reducing the impact of uh, food in terms of sustainability on the entire food chain. So, in a way, if you want, it's the same logic as food safety. For food safety, what did we do? We decided to have uh, a comprehensive uh, approach covering the different steps of the production to assure that each and any step would, be, uh, would ensure food safety. In 2020, the idea, the idea behind the, uh, the farm to fork strategy was a bit the same, to ensure that each and any step of the food chain would deliver in terms of sustainability, reducing the impact of food on the environment and on climate. Obviously, this was part of a bigger program, what is called the European Green Deal. Uh, you know, in Brussels, we like to draw temples. So this is a temple, <laughs> it's a big temple with different columns, and obviously one of these columns is the environment, and the farm to fork is really what food the area where uh, food sustainability should be taken into account and food sustainability decision should be uh, at the heart of the European policies in, in the area of food. In 2020, the strategy was uh, adopted and presented to the public and to the European Parliament, and uh, it contains an action plan that should have or has been, I don't know what's used, uh, delivered between 2020 and 2024 with a number of actions. The idea behind was very simple. The idea was uh, the EU is the global leader in the area of food. If we change, we will make an impact. If we change, the others will follow, and this will change the overall approach to food that we have in the world. Uh, the idea is simple. The implementation, obviously, is much more complex, because when you touch this, you touch a number of structure, tradition, interest, and also you have, you have to deal with uh, a number of trading partners which are not necessarily in line on, with our way of, of thinking. In any case, the, the, the objective was very clear, to reduce the impact of food on the environment and climate, to lead at world level the transition towards a greener food production system, at the same time, let's be honest, also to use this as new opportunities, because as I said, if we want to remain world leader in the area of food, we need also to understand the way the food preferences of people are evolving. And it is clear, you are younger than me, that in your food choice every day, you are probably much greener than me, and you take sustainability consideration that probably our generation was not taking, and certainly the generation of my, my parents were not even considering. So it is clear that the world of food has to change, and this is also creates new uh, opportunity. Last but not least, a food chain which is green, or which is less, more sustainable, is also a food chain which is more resilient, uh, for a number of, of reasons. Uh, if you go local, for instance, uh, then what happens uh, in Ukraine has less impact on your food import and export. Just to give you an idea, if you are able to have uh, a food chain which is uh, 
better integrated and better controlled and more uh, and shorter than the be situations like the COVID crisis or the geopolitical uh, situation that might arise in the Suez Canal or elsewhere will affect you much less. So food chain which is sustainable is also probably more resilient. The food, uh, um, the farm to fork came also with a number of uh, targets, particularly important the reduction of chemical pesticide by 50%, the reduction of the nutrient loss of soil by 50%, the reduction in the sales of antimicrobials uh, that are one of the sources of antimicrobial resistance by again 50%, the increase to 25% of organic production. All these targets are there. Did, were we able to meet them only partially? So this is was the objective, uh, and this objective should go up to 2030. We are on some of them in the right direction, for instance on the increase of organic production we are certainly in the right direction. On other, of this tar on other targets we are probably still you know, lagging a bit behind the objective, especially when it comes to the reduction of pesticide. In addition to this target, there were a number of specific proposals to be adopted, 25. Most of them have been adopted, some of them are in the process of being discussed between the European Parliament and the Council of Ministers of the European Union. Uh, it is clear that it's, uh, it's a difficult discussion sometimes, because for instance when you decide to uh, eliminate or to reduce a certain number of pesticides, you are also uh, imposing to your farmers to produce in a different way. Uh, and you are exposing them to the competitions of other farmers from the rest of the world that might still use the same pesticide that you are forbidding in the EU. So this is an issue of, of discussion and it's certainly an element that, uh, that uh, has, to be taken, uh, has, to, has to be taken into, into account. So that's why uh, the new commission, the second mandate of von der Leyen, uh, President von der Leyen, has decided to uh, take uh, account of some of these uh, difficulties that have arise in the implementation of the farm to fork. The wind of change. Huh? The wind of change. The wind of change, exactly. The wind of change which has a number of reasons. So some of them, uh, as I said, there was a real difficulty in, the, in implementing the action plan. It is clear also that the geopolitical context has changed. I think you were discussing geopolitics this, this, this afternoon. Uh, I don't need to tell you that the last five years have been extremely difficult. The war in Ukraine, the situation in the Middle East. Uh, so all this has affected the EU. Uh, we are also going through uh, an economic situation which is far from being good in the EU. It is also has to be taken into account. Um, so it is clear that now that we have a new commission, some of the priorities will have to be not necessarily redefined, but certainly adjusted to the new, uh, to the new landscape, which is an economic landscape, it is a political landscape. You certainly uh, remember also that part of the European society has strongly protested against some of these gaining measures. I, I remember you know, a few months ago, farmers taking hostage Brussels for a few days because they didn't want to, uh, to implement some of the measures that were in the farm to fork. So it is clear that it's a moment where, um, where we need to uh, uh, reconsider the priority for the future. The Green Deal is still there, the farm to fork is still there, so the overall analysis doesn't change because the situation of the planet, the situation of climate, the challenge of food production remain exactly the same. The question that we are asking ourselves is to what extent we should pursue this, this uh, uh, action plan and how we should uh, re readjust it. So for this, already in January 2024, President von der Leyen decided to create a specific strategic dialogue, which is a structure where uh, basically all the stakeholders of the farming community, of the food community are there. So it's uh, basically a dialogue group. Um, led by uh, Professor Peter Stroschneider, who has been already in charge of the reform of the agricultural policy in Germany. And basically this was a form of discussion that uh, um, represented all the different areas of the food chain. So farmers, food company, NGO, consumers, academics, and so on and so forth. So everybody having a say, scientists, 
was part of this group, and the idea was that the group would come with a report that has been presented in September 2024, uh, which is quite prescriptive. So, as we get, it's not a report from the Commission, it's a report from stakeholders, private stakeholders, completely independent from the Commission. They, 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 they met a number of occasions, and they came up with this report, uh, stressing what, in their views, should be done in the EU in order to follow the, the path of sustainability without having a huge uh, economic impact on the farming sector and on the agri food sector. So this is what uh, has been discussed in this, in this group, and this is where some of the conclusions that this group came with. Uh, first of all, what they presented is a compromise. Compromise between the requests of the farmers, the requests of the food industry, the requests of the green NGOs. So in this respect, it's already uh, a good way forward because it's a discussion that does not reflect necessarily the view of only one segment of society, but it reflects the view of different segments, different areas of the food of the food chain. What they propose is a new approach to sustainability. Uh, based on the idea that a lot has already been decided and that rather than coming with new rules, it is probably time to uh, follow a kind of bottom-up approach, to follow the lead and the indication of the stakeholders and to work more on enforcement and less on new rules. And this is something that I believe uh, it's a message which has been taken up by, by the Commission. So it's probably time to uh, work on what has already been agreed and to make sure that what has been agreed in the last five years is seriously implemented by the different, by the different stakeholders. Uh, there is also an indication on the future of the common agricultural policy, where it is said that the common agricultural policy should work more to help small farmers. As you probably know, uh, most or an important part of the money of the common agricultural policy very often goes to, go to big farmers, depending on the extension of the land. What this uh, group is saying is that we should readjust this, uh, this payment in order to make sure that an important part of the CAP support go to uh, small farmers. And at the same time, that it is increased the level of payment based on environmental services. So the idea is to provide money to farmers, not just for production, but to provide specific environmental service to society. And this is already there in a way, it's just that it has to be further, uh, further extended. And that is the notion which is very important, and I, I think it's, it becomes particularly important today after the US election. And it's the notion of food sovereignty. The idea that we should be completely independent in terms of food, that we should be, we should be able to have our own food and not to depend not depending on, on others for our uh, food, uh, food, uh, food security. Which is, in a way, uh, something that probably deserves some discussion. As I say, this is not a report by the Commission, it's a report by, by the stakeholders, but some of this notion have been taken up in the, in the discussion that we are now having on the future of the common agricultural policy and on the future of the farm to fork strategy. The question here is, do we really need this notion of food sovereignty, because... Which is also discussed at the national level. Exactly. Italy because, as well. because, you know, uh, we don't have an issue of food security in the EU. I think we, I started from that. We, food is there. Uh, and, by the way, most of our food is European food, because we are, we are big European producers. So, do you really... What do we intend for food sovereignty? Because, you know, on one... One notion could be, okay, let's be able to react to geopolitical crisis, and this is a good notion. The other meaning, and I'm afraid that some, especially in the farming community, might intend the other way, is let's close ourselves to the rest of the world. Let's kill the discussion of Mercosur, for instance, because this would mean importing much more food from, from South America. So this is a discussion that we need to have. Uh, I guess uh, it is important that we have this consciousness that we discuss the issue of food sovereignty because some of the issues that happened in the last five years have indicated that probably we need to be a bit more conscious on the way we produce food and on the importance that food has in our society. But let's also pay attention to the global consequences because if we close ourselves, others will close themselves. 
So we should not expect that if we don't import food from, say, South America, we will still be able to sell cars to South America. Uh, this zero-sum game no, <laughs> doesn't very often work. So this is something that we should take, we should take into account. In any case, the next step is now obviously for uh, the future commissioners, and particularly for Christopher Hansen, that will be the future commissioner for agriculture and food. Um, it has been given by the president a specific mission letter. I don't know to what extent you are familiar with the system, but when a new commissioner arrives, he gets from the president a mission letter. So it's a letter of five pages where the president tells him I want you to do this, that, and that. It's a list of action, basically, or a list of uh, objectives that the future commissioner should, uh, should uh, fulfill. And in this list of action, there is clearly an indication to work on the basis of the suggestion of the strategic dialogue, to create a specific um, European Bureau for Agriculture and Food, in order to continue discussion with the relevant stakeholders, and to define in the next 100 days, so by February 2025, a new vision for uh, the agriculture and food sector of, of the EU. Uh, so the idea here, and I want to conclude my intervention on this point, is that in the next uh, few weeks a lot will be happening. By February, the new Commission of Agriculture will define this new vision on food, so the way to implement the message of this uh, strategic dialogue and to reform the approach to sustainability. And also, as of June, we will discuss, we will start the discussion on the new MFF. What is the MFF? It's the multi-financial framework. It's basically the budget of the Union for the next years. And there, you will have to decide how much money is given to the agri-food area and where this money goes, so what is spent for. Uh, so this discussion will take place between June and September 2025, so probably part of what I say today will be completely different in, in, in few months. So I guess the message here is really to you know, remain, stay tuned on this issue because the, the world of and the approach to food food safety and food sustainability will change radically in the next couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Valenta. Now we have a few minutes. Yes, just a few minutes for your questions, comments, uh, and so on. We, yes, there is one. So good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you for your uh, um, seminar. And uh, I'm Letizia uh, from the University of Turin. And uh, I wanted to ask something uh, related to the um, issue of food security. So um, uh, to the issue of food security, I think it's very important to mention also uh, welfare of animals. Okay, because <laughs> and. Um, Unfortunately, uh, there is a small regulation at the European level for uh, uh, welfare of animals, and as you said uh, before, the um, um, most part of the money from the cup goes to big farmers and to big uh, farm industries, so which often do not uh, follow the regulation of the European level of, or um, violate the, the regulation of the European level in. Uh, um, in terms of welfare of animals, I mean. Um, do you think that uh, the solution to stop this violation is to uh, have more controls uh, from the Commission? So, because I know that uh, the Commission, as you said, controls the farming industries, etc. So, there is the need for more controls. Um, there is the need for more regulation. Uh, um, I don't know. What do you think about it? So thanks for this question, which is very dear to my heart, also because I've been working on animal welfare for a few years when it was in the cabinet, it was one of my, of my files. Um, it's, it's a very important issue, I think it's exactly the explanation of why the food uh, sustainability is essential, because if you ask my, my father, he doesn't have any idea about animal welfare, he doesn't, he doesn't, no, he's not interested in animal welfare. 
why I think our generation, my generation, even more your generation, is uh, putting a lot of attention to your welfare. So this shows that the food, the way we produce our food has to change. On animal welfare in the EU, uh, I will say a few things. First, uh, allow me to be a bit euro-nationalist there. I think we have the best animal welfare in the world. And, you know, I visit the different farming sites in different areas of the world. I think that the notion of animal welfare has been mostly developed in the EU. Uh, maybe the US are following to a certain extent, but the idea of animal welfare is very, very strong in the EU. Uh, there are, what, if you ask me what is missing to get to an optimum standard, I would say probably three elements. One, we have a very fragmented legislation, so there is no, we have a general food law. You don't have a general animal welfare law. You have a number of directives in different sectors that are difficult to comply with. Are directives, so they can be lead different measures at national level. So this has to be improved. By the way, in the Fab 4, one of the 25 actions was animal welfare law. Then there was so much resistance by a number of sectors that this has been way downgraded to a draft on animal transport and the welfare of pets. And this, if you want my personal opinion, this is me talking not necessarily the European Fisher did forget it because it was the occasion to have a comprehensive animal welfare law. So this is what is missing, I believe. First point. Second, controls. Controls are there. I wouldn't say that um, big companies do not respect animal welfare. They tend to respect the minimum standards. Some of them, there might be cases of non-respect. But usually, uh, it's more an issue of you know, getting to the minimum standards without doing any extra effort. Yes, we need more controls. There again, it's an issue of, uh, of uh, resources. If you have uh, 200 controls to make every year, you might want, and you might disagree with me, but I guess you might want to focus more on food safety than to animal welfare, because food safety might kill you, animal welfare don't kill anybody, or does kill the animals, but it doesn't have an impact on the safety of people. So this is where, if you look at the level of controls, we have controls on animal welfare, but obviously the controls that we do on food safety and other food safety issues are much more uh, frequent in a way. The third issue, and this is up to you in a way, but it's also where we have responsibility, is that we should make consumers able to decide. Uh, why? Because I see animal welfare as a two-tier approach. There is a minimum standard that everybody has to respect. And then there are extra standards that we should, on which we should give the choice to consumers. I make one example. Uh, free range eggs. Okay? When you have the possibility to choose, most of the consumers, they go for free range eggs. Why? Because they are better for the welfare of the world. And we do it because we have the possibility to choose. Unfortunately, this possibility to choose does not really exist on other issues. So if we were given the information, we would be able to make an informed decision. This is what, in my opinion, is missing. So if I were an NGO working on your welfare, I would request more labeling, because this is where you can make the, the difference. You might have entry level in terms of price product, which just respect the minimum standards of animal welfare. And then you should have on the market uh, products maybe a little, a little bit more expensive, but where the animal welfare standards are very high. And then you give the possibility to, to consumers to choose. And I believe, I'm convinced, that most consumers, certainly me, certainly you, which would go for the, for, the, for, for the better product, the product with a higher level of animal welfare. Unfortunately, at the moment, we don't have this differentiation, except for the uh, limited issues like free range eggs, and when we have this possibility, usually consumers make the right choice. So the, the more progressive or more animal, or better animal welfare choice. So there are a few issues to, issues to be done.
doing uh, well and are in terrible conditions. Also, the meat that people are going to eat is in bad conditions. So, yes, of course, now uh, maybe uh, the commission has different um, I don't know, uh, perspectives. So, she want, uh, if you want to concentrate more on uh, controls of uh, specific food, I don't know. But uh, she will also be very concentrated on what I mean, because it's not just an energy or heat. Uh, it's uh, not just an it's also a uh, security thing, so we have to eat good food. Uh, and uh, that's the situation. I agree with you, and also an element which I forgot, but which also is important, is how we are able to impose, not actually like what impose, but how we are able to make sure that our trade partners apply the same standards. Because I mean, it's very nice to impose on European producers very high animal welfare standards. But then if we ask them to compete on the global market with you know, production coming from other countries where the animal welfare standards might be lower, uh, then the level playing field is not there. And, and I see this more and more, as I say, I, I work on fish aid, we negotiate fish aid quota, and as European we respect a high number of rules, uh, control of the vessels, and we compete with fishermen in the rest of the world that they don't use the same system. And we ask as Europeans to do more and more and more. And our industry is rightly complaining. We say, yes, but we compete, you know, we fish the same tuna as you know, countries that do not have control system for vessels, do not have you know, uh, social uh, rules for the, for the people working, for the crew on board, and so on. So, so if we want to be serious, about animal welfare, and also if you want more generally to be serious about sustainability, one of the things that we need to do, and there I'm a bit, you know, uh, again, euro nationalist, <laughs> we need to be able to impose or to make sure that our trading partners they play with the same rules. Because otherwise it doesn't work. Otherwise, what we would be doing would just displace the production in places where it's cheaper, it's less animal welfare, it's less safety, it's less. Uh, and so on and so forth. So if you want to keep good production in Europe, and if you want to keep high level of safety, high level of security, and so on and so forth, we need to also make sure that the other people play with the same rules as our, our farmers and our food producers. Other comments? Oh. Yes, please. Sorry. <laughs> So, my name is Melissa, I come from the University of Belgrade, but I work in a sector that does monitoring, reporting of uh, EU funds development assistance in the area of agriculture and rural development. So, I think I'm primarily speaking from that side. I'm just wondering, I don't know how, how informed you are about like, the work of the DG Near and uh, what's happening in the Western Balkans in general. And basically, we have major issues with aligning our legal framework uh, according to the EU key, and especially with uh, there's big po political controversy when it comes to law on GMO and general food, uh, food safety. And even bigger challenges in the absorption of import funds, uh, with especially the new financial perspective, where we have larger funds and big possibilities of decommitment. I would say, uh, but if we take into the regard the uh, potential, or I would say certain uh, lithium exploitation in Serbia, which may not be a Euro European Commission backed, but is definitely backed by member states. If the accession process actually happens for us anywhere in the near future, with all of these in line potentially, uh, how would an average Serbian farmer even be competitive at an EU market? That's a good question. I would like to have all the answers. But I believe that the best answer comes from the, the historical example of enlargement. Because we had exactly the same discussion in, in Poland, in Lithuania, in the Czech Republic, before the big enlargement. And uh, I believe that the recent history of what happened after the enlargement has shown that it works. That the, 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 certainly there is a need for self transaction, let's be clear. It is clear that, for instance, if you take the Polish example, which is probably the most important one, because they have a huge farming community. Uh, it worked. So there has been a restructuring of the system, there has been probably a reduction also in the number of farmers, but overall, 
the economy and the support of the common agricultural policy has made so that you know, the, the, the living standards of Polish farmers have increased. I don't think there is any Polish farmer nowadays that will say, I want to go back to before the line. I think the living standards has improved, have improved. They have improved before because of the single market, they have improved because they have you know, bigger, bigger market to deal with, they have improved because of the common agricultural policy, they have improved also because the general economic context of the country has improved. So I don't want to give all the merits to you, but probably the general economic context of Poland has improved significantly also because they are members of the EU. So when you take all this into account, uh, I, I think that, you know, and I really hope that Serbia and other countries will join the EU as soon as possible, that that day it will correspond to an improvement in, in, in the life of Serbian farmers. And I'm not saying that this will happen without uh, any, any instruction. It is clear, there is no some instruction to be done. There are a number of rules, sometimes even too many, maybe or too difficult to apply. All this, I, I know, and you know, uh, we had the same discussion again in Poland or Italian, the farmers were complaining about, you know, all the papers and they need to fill in to get the support of the common agricultural policy. But all in all, when I look at that, I say, it worked. It was better after than before. So, are you referring to the moment now or to the perspective of the future realignment? Mm -hmm. Even on the property of land or on the production itself? The production in that entire area. Why? I, I, I don't know the specific. So. Uh, since has shown that uh, basically they won't be devastating uh, consequences both for the agricultural land in that area and for the population in that area. From what? Uh, from lithium mining. I think that's like yeah. what's very specific about our case. <laughs> This is very specific. Obviously, I don't know that much the subject, so I prefer not to say stupid things on something I, 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 I don't know. Uh, but I guess this is, uh, in which way this is linked to the PS accession? I was going to think it's agriculture and just our agricultural competitiveness in the future. Okay. Okay. But it's something, it's a process which is said by you, or just. To be honest, I need to, to inform myself on this. No, no, I need to inform myself on this. By the way, you my email. If you want to send me the information, I'm happy to edit it. Because, you know, the European Commission is not well informed. Not well I, I don't work in engineers. I never work in engineers. <laughs> okay, so I think our time is over. So thank you very much.